Okay, so in this video, we're going to talk about uh, making glycogen, glycogen synthesis, also known as glycogenesis. Glyco referring to glycogen, genesis, of course, meaning uh, to make. So what is that? It's literally what it sounds like, making glycogen from glucose. So basically, we're storing glucose when we make glycogen. Okay, so when would we want, when would we want glycogen synthesis to occur? When would, we, when would we want to store glucose? Well, it's when we have a lot of glucose and when we have a lot of energy, a lot of ATP. So in the fed state. Okay, so um, where does this occur? Um, it occurs in the cytosol of liver and muscle cells. Okay, so now how do we get this going? Well, I have here activation of G1P. Um, which is glucose 1-phosphate, but before, before we even have that happen, we have to get glucose 1-phosphate, and how do we do that? Well, there's a mutase that takes glucose 6-phosphate and converts it into glucose 1-phosphate. It just moves the phosphate from the 6 position to the 1 position to give us glucose 1-phosphate. Now, when, when we're making glycogen from glucose, we're adding glucose units. We're specifically adding them um, coming sort of as an extension from glucose 1-phosphate, but they don't come directly from glucose 1-phosphate. That's why we have to activate glucose 1-phosphate. So glucose 1-phosphate needs to be activated in order to actually form the glycosidic linkages, okay? And so um, let's talk about that. So what happens is that we take glucose 1-phosphate and we combine it with uh, UCP, which is uridine triphosphate, and uh, we combine these two, two molecules to make UDP glucose. Okay, now, what does UTP look like? UTP looks like this. Um, got it up here. Okay, so up here, this is the, the U nitrogenous base, and then ribose, and then um, the three phosphates there. Okay, so um, we combine them together, and two of those phosphates come off as a pyrophosphate, which is hydrolyzed into two inorganic phosphates by pyrophosphatase, and we make UDP glucose. The enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is UDP glucose pyrophosphorylase. Okay, so, um, and the, the pyrophosphatase here that cleaves the, uh, the, the, inner, the inorganic pyrophosphate into two inorganic phosphates uh, actually drives uh, the, the formation of, of UDP glucose. So this is a, an example here of reaction coupling driving a certain reaction to completion. So um, just having glucose 1-phosphate plus UTP um, going to, to UDP glucose and the inorganic phosphate um, has a delta G of zero. So it's not really driven to happen, but the hydrolysis of, um, of the pyrophosphate into two inorganic phosphates is highly exergonic. And so the overall process is exergonic as a result and therefore spontaneous, okay? Um, so we make UDP glucose. Now UDP glucose is the actual um, donor of the glucose unit in glycogen synthesis. This is the actual donor of the glucose unit. Okay, so you might be asking why? Like, why do we do this to glucose 1-phosphate? Why would we create UDP glucose? Why not just add the glucose 1-phosphate to an existing uh, glycogen strand? And the answer is that UDP, uh, which is just this portion of the molecule, apart from glucose, um, is a better leaving group than simply uh, an inorganic phosphate, which is on glucose 1-phosphate. Okay, so the better leaving group allows the reaction to happen more, re more readily. Okay. So let's get into the enzyme that actually catalyzes glycogen synthesis. It's a uh, uniquely named glycogen synthase. So literally, quite literally, maker of glycogen. Okay, so what is its function? Well, it adds a glucose unit coming from UDP glucose, of course, right? Because we said that's the actual glucose unit donor. Uh, it adds it to an existing glycogen chain. And that's actually an important piece of information. That existing glycogen chain is uh, a, at least eight residues long. Okay, so um, I'll get back to, to that in that detail about the existing glycogen chain momentarily. And uh, so just, just for clarification's sake, it adds a glucose unit and it makes glycogen, a, a certain glycogen chain, one glucose unit longer, okay? So before we actually get started, when would this be active? Well, when would we be making glycogen? It's during high energy states, right? During the fed state. I've already mentioned it, but it's just a little reminder here, okay? 
So imagine you have a glycogen chain here that is some number of residues long, some n residues long. Uh, I've only shown two here, but you can imagine that, uh, oh, by the way, I indicate here that this is not an OH group, it's an OR group. Um, now that's just trying to, me trying to indicate that the chain is longer than, than what I've shown here. I'm just, I've only drawn two uh, to make it so that it's not taking up the whole, the whole page or the whole screen, okay? So we start off with that UDP glucose and this glycogen chain that's N residues long. And so what happens is that um, the OH group on uh, carbon number four of the non-reducing end of glycogen is gonna go through, attack carbon number one on the UDP glucose kicking off um, the UDP as a leaving group. So the UDP comes off here as a leaving group, okay? And then what happens is that this, this glucose unit here basically gets attached here to the non-reducing end. So that glucose unit is now here. So we had two initially, and now we've got three there. Now, it's not just three, right? It was N residues long, but now this glycogen chain is N plus one residues long. Okay, so it's one glucose unit longer than it was initially, okay? So um, this UDP that we made, uh, its story is not really over. Um, we need to turn that back into UTP so that we can have that previous reaction occur again, right? So we can, we can activate another glucose one phosphate. So we need to regenerate um, UTP using that UDP. So that UDP is gonna head over and it's gonna combine with, um, with ATP and ATP is just gonna give up one of its phosphates to UDP um, to basically turn UDP uh, into a triphosphate, uh, UTP, and ATP loses the phosphate to become ADP. This is catalyzed by nucleoside diphosphate kinase, um, and this is an isoenergetic process, right? The delta G is zero. Um, so what's important though is that um, that UTP that's formed, or um, yeah, that UTP that's formed there can now activate another glucose 1-phosphate, and then we can go through and add another UDP glucose to the glycogen chain if we want to elongate it further. So that's basically glycogen synthase. Now, earlier I mentioned that this adds to an existing glycogen chain. So the question might be then, what if we didn't have an existing chain? Well, that's when this this uh, this dude called glycogenin, glyco, oh my goodness, glycogenin, <laughs> glycogenin uh, initiates things. And the way I remember that is that there's glycogen and then in initiates, okay? I actually just came with that, up with that. Genius, anyway. <laughs> so glycogen in initiates things if we don't already have a, an existing glycogen chain. So let's look at the initiation of glycogen synthesis. You might be wondering why I didn't show you the initiation of glycogen synthesis um, first. Um, it's because it's not, it doesn't really uh, um, always occur. In fact, I have it written here. Um, so initiation of glycogen synthesis occurs if there's no um, existing glycogen chain for glycogen synthase to act on. But this it, this doesn't always occur because glycogen may not be totally depleted. So we really think about glycogen synthesis, synthesis uh, we're typically thinking about glycogen synthase being like the rate limiting step, which I should know, by the way. So this is rate limiting. And therefore regulated, okay. All right, so glycogen, and what's the deal with that? So we still have to have UDP glucose because that's the sort of donor of the glucose unit. But instead of donating to an existing glycogen chain, instead, what it does is that um, an OH group on a tyrosine residue on glycogenin, which is a protein, will actually be the thing that attacks the uh, carbon number one of the um, glucose on UDP glucose kicking off the UDP. So we have that UDP then that comes off as a leaving group. Now, what catalyzes that reaction um, is, is glycogenin. Glycogenin is an auto glycosylation. Glycosylation is just uh, when something, when you add a, 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 a sugar moiety to something. Uh, so auto glycosylation is self glycosylation, right? So this glycogenin glycosylates itself, right? Um, so this is like a post-translational modification of this protein. It does it to, himself, to itself. 
so now we have the glucose residue that was right here. That is right here, okay? Attached to glycogen in, okay? And so now we have this non-reducing end available uh, to basically go through and add more glucose residues to. Um, and of course this UDP goes back and gets regenerated, right? Like it did over here, okay? Um, you, it goes to, to regenerate UTP, but now we have uh, glycogen in with just that one residue on it. Um, so glycogenin can actually autoglycosylate itself uh, some more and it, it will continue to do so. So this bit of information here over to the right, glycogenin adds a few more glucose residues and then at a certain point, once it's about eight residues long, then glycogen synthase takes over. Okay, so in essence, glycogenin is, is uh, or acts as a primer, so to speak, for glycogen synthesis. It kind of gets things going and then glycogen synthase takes over. Okay, so now um, all I've shown you though now so far is ma the making of these alpha 1, 4 linkages, right? This is an alpha 1, 4 linkage, right? An alpha 1, 4 linkage. What happens at the branch points? 